Welcome to The Advocates, I'm Aaron Dean. A new report shows that most Americans do not support a national don't say gay law. The proposal is being pushed by newly installed House Speaker Mike Johnson. A data for progress survey of over 1,200 voters reveals a 37% support of, of a national don't say gay law while 52% oppose. Partisan splits are clear with 58% Republican support and 72% Democratic opposition. Johnson has also introduced the Stop the Sexualization of Children Act and has expressed opposition to gender affirming care. GLAAD is calling a petition targeting the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and its LGBTQIA plus performers a desperate plea for attention. A group called One Million Moms organized the petition which claimed the parade was going to be a non-binary and transgender extravaganza. GLAAD CEO Sarah Kate Ellis says LGBTQ performers in Thanksgiving Day parades are not new. She also says brands have learned that these are not concerned moms but dedicated anti-LGBTQ activists. Ellis also says queer people are just as welcome at parades as they are at Thanksgiving tables and around the country. The U.S. Supreme Court says that Florida cannot enforce a law limiting drag shows. Justices citing the court's decision noted complex First Amendment issues in the case. The Protection of Children Act was originally challenged by the popular Orlando restaurant Hamburger Mary's, which hosts drag brunches. They claim that the law led to a loss in business. Conservative judges, there were three of them, said that they would have let the law take effect. The Supreme Court's decision in 2015 to recognize marriage equality nationwide was a landmark ruling for queer Americans. 13 years before that, in 2003, the journey for marriage equality began in Massachusetts with the Goodridge case. Massachusetts became the first state to say that marriage was for all people. Attorney Mary Bonato is part of that history. Bonato works with the LGBTQ legal advocates and defenders or glad for short. She represented those pushing for equality in 2003 and she stood by James Obergefell's side when the right to marry was guaranteed in 2015. I had the honor of speaking with the attorney about the legacy of both cases and fighting the incredibly important fight. Well, we're here to discuss marriage equality. So here at the Advocate Channel, we really do love a little bit of history. So kind of explain to our audience what significant event occurred on November 18th, 2003 in Massachusetts that became a landmark ruling for marriage equality. Yeah, what happened is the Supreme Judicial Court, the Massachusetts High Court, for the first time ever, issued a ruling saying that same-sex couples have the right to marry legally under the state constitution and set off lots of changes, but also um, delayed its decision for six months to give the state time to implement things. And instead that time was used for the opposition which set in in a nanosecond, but it all has a happy ending, right? So um, it was, you know, it was the case that broke the historic barrier and really changed how we think about what equality means for for queer people. And can you give us a little bit of background on the Goodridge versus the Department of Public Health and what it stemmed from? Sure, absolutely. I mean, as with everything, what has gone before matters a lot. So, you know, for many, many, many years and decades, many people had wanted to marry, didn't try, later they did try, they lost. And then, you know, in more recent times, in the 90s, you had Hawaii with a really important effort to, to allow for marriage, um, actually some progress in the courts, but it was thwarted by a constitutional amendment there that said only the legislature can change marriage. But then I teamed up with some people in Vermont, um, Beth Robinson and Susan Murray, to bring another case there under the state constitution. So it was the first, you know, designed affirmative case on the mainland of the United States. And on December 20th, 1999, we got a decision saying, you're entitled to all the same rights and protections and obligations as any married couple, but we're gonna let the legislature decide what to call it and how to do it. And that set off the whole fight about, is it marriage, is it something else? And the something else won, but the something else itself was pretty important, which is creating civil unions as truly a parallel 
to marriage, but without all the social significance and therefore protection that comes with being able to say you're married and obviously no federal protections. In any event, um, after Vermont, you know, I was living in Massachusetts at the time and I couldn't go to the grocery store without people saying, why can't we do what Vermont did? And, and getting lots of questions about marriage and, and frankly, Massachusetts was another really strong state uh, with a strong court and a strong constitution to pursue marriage. And, you know, that court was first on November 18th, 2003. You know, you argued before the Supreme Court in the Obergefell versus Hodges case that led to marriage equality nationwide. You know, what has that advocacy journey been like from Goodridge to cases, you know, like in 2015, the SCOTUS decision? Yeah, you know, it's a journey, but for me and for so many, right? Because that took the work of millions of people, really like, you know, queer people themselves, the family and friends and co-workers and everything who know and love us and who just felt like, what are you doing denying this basic liberty, this basic protection, this basic source of family to to these people? It doesn't make any sense. And that's what we kept going at in court is, why does this make any sense? Um, what is the reason? And, the, you know, as the Goodridge Court became the first to say, there wasn't a good reason. So in any event, it just took many, many people across many states. And I do want to say, like, just a little because you like history, right? So one of the things that I think really helped to get to nationwide marriage equality was obviously Goodridge because somebody had to be first. But another piece of it was the 2013 successful challenge at the Supreme Court to the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. And that's the famous case involving Edie Windsor, uh, her lawyers, Robbie Kaplan, ACLU, um, Stanford Supreme Court Clinic, you know, and tons of other people. And we had at GLAD, my 1A GLAD, had brought some of the first DOMA cases because we had the first marriages. And DOMA was about federal government saying, you might be married. And we normally provide XYZ to married people as a matter of federal law, but you, you're crossed out. You get none of it. And, you know, we had people, you know, one guy who, um, you know, together with his partner since he was 18, and he was in his um, 80s when we met him. And when his partner then spouse died you know and went he went to social security you know to get widower benefits they they said no uh, and he couldn't believe after all these years of paying into the system that he would be erased in this way anyway they go on like there's just so many stories there's been so much positives and members of people's joy and their resilience in their families regardless of government recognition but then there's also been really a lot of practical and also social benefits from the recognition um, and getting there just took lots of court cases all over the country after the DOMA decision. You know, ultimately there were 100 cases filed in federal court, um, over 100, seeking marriage because that DOMA decision was so clear. You can't tell people who are married that they're not married. It's disrespectful. There's no reason for it. And that really, I think, just gave so much momentum to the marriage case of Obergefell. And Obergefell itself, I will just say, it came out of Ohio, one person's experience that I think everybody knows you know, Jim Obergefell, who's, um, you know, dramatic marriage in Maryland, taking a medically equipped plane to get there because um, Jim's partner had ALS. Um, but anyway, then partner dies and they won't even list Jim Obergefell as a surviving spouse on the death certificate, you know, really making him feel, I'm roughly quoting him, but he tells his story so well, um, you know, that they were going to be separated now in eternity. And, you know, he didn't want that, you know, according to government forms. So in any event, it took so much for so long. And I will want, I do want to say that one thing that's super important is why all this marriage work was going on. People used to think all we did is marriage. And the answer is no, we've done lots of other things in this movement along the way. And now sometimes people say like, do you do anything other than trans? And I was like, yeah, we always do a lot of things <laughs> um, at the same time. So. In any event, it's quite the victory. And um, I do think one of the great things about the marriage fight overall is people used to tell me, you know, in the 90s, Mary, forget about it. This is nuts. You are never going to win. It's impossible. But, you know, we've climbed this arc of justice uh, before. We've done the impossible. And I think we can continue doing that with the challenges we face today. 
Thanks so much for watching The Advocates. Download the app in the Apple or Google Play Store to stream us live, and you can even watch us on YouTube. For The Advocate Channel, I'm Aaron Dean.